like a smile and Part 1 I'm thinking of taking a year off university next year, and I'd like to travel around Europe. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 7. Good morning. How can I help you? I'm thinking of taking a year off university next year and I'd like to travel around Europe. OK, then. Do you have any idea where you'd like to go? Well, I was thinking of starting in France and then working my way up to Eastern Europe, possibly going as far as Slovakia. Well, there are a number of ways you can do this, and we have various options available. It really depends on your budget and how you'd like to travel. That's just the thing, really. Um, I mean, I've just finished my second year at university, so obviously I'd like to do it in as cheap a way as possible. That's fine. Could you give me a rough idea of the price range you're looking at? Realistically speaking, I'm hoping to pay between about £700 and £900. Pounds. I could stretch to £1,100, pounds, but that's really my limit. How long are you thinking of going for? About 10 months. To be honest, you'd be better off travelling for about 7 months, if that's your budget. OK, that's not too bad. So, how would you suggest I travel? Well, because of the time limit, I don't think walking is a viable option. Of course, in this day and age, the most convenient way to get around is by flying, particularly if you've got quite a bit you want to see in a short space of time. Saying that, I still think the best way to get around Europe is by train. As a student, you can also get a student rail card, which means cheap affairs. That sounds brilliant. How do I go about getting a rail card? Well, if you decide that's what you want to do, then we can organise that all for you. You'll need to fill in a form and provide us with two passport photos, mm -hmm. and we'll do the rest. It costs about £36 plus about £10 administration costs. Great. That's really not expensive at all. And what about buses? I was just thinking if I decide to go to places which are a bit more remote... There are always local buses, but these are not always a good idea. They can be quite unreliable and in some areas quite dangerous because the buses tend to be overcrowded and some of the drivers drive way too fast. So I would suggest you don't do this. That sounds quite frightening. So what are my options then? You could hire a car, but it can be expensive. Still... I do think if you're thinking about going to smaller towns and places which are off the beaten track, then hiring a car is by far the better way to do it. You can also look at sharing the costs by hiring a car with someone else. That's a good idea. I guess I could put a message on the internet. You could do that. But don't forget that you meet people when you're travelling and you'll probably find someone who's going to the same place as you are. That's true. I want to stay in youth hostels, so I'm sure I'll find people who are interested in going to the same places. Oh, one last thing. What about taxis? I was thinking about if I go out at night. I use taxis all the time here. Ah, oh, but taxis abroad are a different story. In certain countries, they're no problem, but by and large, taxi fares are high. Oh. If you do go out at night, try walking home, but make sure you don't do this alone. Try and find people to go out with at night or come home at a reasonable time. But if you're staying in youth hostels, you should find plenty of young people to go out with at night. I'm sure I will. Now you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10.
Now listen to the next part of the conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. Now, have you thought about how you'd like to travel to France? Not really, no. There are basically three ways. You can go by ferry, which leaves every day and night, or there's the hovercraft, which is more pricey, but will get you there quicker, and, of course, you could fly. Well, I don't think flying is an option for me, as it'll be too expensive. So I suppose I'll choose one of the other two. It's a pity, really, as I don't fancy the idea of travelling by sea. Last time I did that, I got terribly seasick. <laughs> well, you're in luck then, as at the moment there's a special deal on flights to France. Ah. In fact, a plane ticket is now half the price of a ferry ticket, which is usually the cheapest option. That's great. I'll do that then. I much prefer flying anyway. I'll need to get some details off you then. Firstly, how will you be paying? Cash, cheque or credit card? If you pay by cheque, you'll need a cheque guarantee card. I don't have my cheque book with me, so it'll have to be by credit card. Fine, that's no problem. If you could just sign over here, and then we'll have a look at flight times, and I can sort out a youth travel card for you. Fine. Oh, can I use your pen, please? No problem. Now, let's look at times. There is a flight leaving at 9am, and one that leaves half an hour later... Or you can choose a later flight at 11.30. No, I think 11.30 is too late, so I think I'd prefer the flight that leaves after 9. I'm not very good at getting up in the morning. <laughs> no problem. Just give me a moment. Right, that's booked for you. Please remember that if you want to change this, you must give 24 hours notice or you will lose your place. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear two students talking about a school project. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi, Lynn. How's your project coming along? Oh, not very well. I've got all the information, but I can't seem to organise it into a presentation. Well, you'd better hurry. You only have one more week. Yes, that's OK. It's just that... Oh. Well, why don't you try your presentation on me? Maybe I can help. Oh, really? Great! OK, well, I've chosen solar power for my subject and I'm going to talk specifically about domestic water heating. You know, like the ones popular in America. I've got some facts here. Oh, that's good. But just start your presentation from the beginning. Oh, right. Well, he here we go then. There are many reasons why we should be looking elsewhere for energy sources. As most people are aware, fossil fuels and other such non-renewable sources are by definition finite, so something needs to be in operation soon. Currently, there are a number of alternative energy sources available which can, with a little preparation, be used to provide for a significant part of our domestic energy requirements. In this presentation, I am focusing on solar power and its application as a domestic water heater. As a renewable energy source, solar power is in many ways ideal. 
the amount of the sun's energy which reaches the earth every minute exceeds the energy that the global population consumes in a year. Although scientists argue that it is not finite, sunlight is certainly a long-lasting resource which is not depleted through use, and solar power converters use this energy without needing any complex moving parts. Once collected and stored, solar energy can be used for many purposes, but it is becoming increasingly popular as a domestic heating source. Generally a building that is heated by solar power will have its water heated by solar power as well, and this has even worked in areas that are not exposed to long hours of direct sunlight such as the United Kingdom, although not so well as in warmer climates. Why have you stopped? Well, that's all I've got so far. Oh, well. Start by talking about how effective it is. Oh, OK. Well, there are a number of factors that influence how efficient solar power can be. The first, obviously, is the amount of sunlight, and this is dependent on season, time of day and climate. Although the UK has something of a bad reputation for sunshine, it is actually quite productive during some parts of the year. Given a sufficient size of solar panel and water storage tank, solar power can provide all of our water heating requirements in June and July and even provide the majority until October. From October to the end of the year, this figure falls dramatically. December is the least productive, being able to supply less than 5% of the average household's hot water requirement. It is at this point that solar power needs to be supplemented with a more traditional form of heating. From January, solar power becomes more effective at a rate of about 20% per month, although this rise decelerates to around 18% by May. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now say something about this water heater. Do you have any information about that? Oh yes, I've got an illustration of a water tank here. Well, that's good, but you'll have to describe it. Right. Well, the ideal water tank in the UK has a capacity of 45 to 50 litres, but must be at least 40 litres to be effective. The solar coil is put in the bottom of the tank to heat the water. Now remember that solar heated water will not get quite as hot as fossil fuel water heaters. The bottom half of the tank is normally 20 degrees, and this is why it is important not to have a tank that is too large, as that would take too much energy to heat. In this illustration, it rises to 40 degrees from halfway up. Don't forget that hot water rises, so the top third of the tank is the hottest and reaches an average temperature of 65 degrees. And what's the second layer around the tank? Oh, that's insulation. Because the tank is often either outside or just under the roof, rigid foam is used as an insulation layer. It should be at least 80 millimetres thick all around. Well, that seems like a good presentation. All you need to do is to prepare some short notes and a larger illustration so you can use it as a demonstration and you'll be fine. Oh, you think so? Well, thanks very much for the help. Maybe I could do the same for you one day. Maybe. Anyway, I have to go. Good luck. Thanks. Bye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students discussing the subject of rock art. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-seven. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-seven. Hello, David. Oh, hi, Mia. Sorry, I'm a bit late. Oh, no problem. Thanks for agreeing to help me with my assignment today. I really needed to go over it with someone. Sure. You were going to talk about European rock art, weren't you? Yes, the rock drawings in the caves of Lascaux in Western France. Oh, fantastic! Over thirteen thousand years old, I believe. What sort of drawings are they? They're drawings of animals, on the whole, but you can also find some human representations as well as some signs. There are roughly six hundred drawings at Lascaux. Really? Were they mostly pictures of bulls? Well, no, actually. The animal most depicted was the horse.、Hmm. Have a look at this graph.、Hmm. It shows the distribution of the different animals. You see, first the horse, and then after that a sort of prehistoric bull. Oh, okay. That's interesting, isn't it? And the third most commonly drawn creature was the stag. There were some other animals, but these are the main ones. What are the drawings like? I mean, what sort of style? Well, the bulls are depicted very figuratively. They're not very realistic. They're very big by comparison to the other drawings of people and signs. They appear to be almost three-dimensional in some cases, following the contours of the cave walls. But of course, they're not. Amazing. Perhaps they felt these animals were the most impressive and needed to be represented like that. Yeah, maybe. The drawings of humans, by contrast, consist of just simple lines, like the stick figures my little sister draws. Perhaps humans were seen as less important. Hmm. Perhaps. What about the signs? How did they draw them? There doesn't appear to be much evidence of signs, and those that have been found are usually made up of little points. Rather like Aboriginal art from Australia. Yes, something like that, but not as complex, of course. So, apart from the bulls and horses and stags, were there any other creatures depicted? In one or two chambers, you do find pictures of fish,、oh. but they're quite rare. What sort of size is the cave? It must be quite large to have that many pictures. Well, it's actually a number of interlinking chambers, really. Here's a map showing where the different drawings can be found. Oh, good. Let's have a look at that. The first twenty meters inside the cave slope down very steeply to the first hall in the network. That's called the Great Hall of the Bulls. Here. Okay. Then, off to the left, we have the painted gallery, which is about thirty meters long and is basically a continuation of this first hall. But further into the cave. Exactly.、Oh. Then we find a second lower gallery called the lateral passage. This opens off the aisle to the right of the great hall of the bulls. It connects the next chamber with an area known as the main gallery. At the end of the main gallery is the chamber of felines. There are one or two other connecting chambers, but there's no evidence of man having been in these rooms. Before you hear the rest of the discussion. You have some time to look at questions twenty-eight to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-eight to thirty. Is the cave open to the public today? Well, no, because after the initial discovery in nineteen forty, it was opened and literally millions of people came through to see the drawings.、Uh. Then, in the fifties, the experts started to worry about the damage being done to the drawings, and the government finally closed the Lascaux cave in nineteen sixty-three. Is that so?
It wasn't really the tourists that were doing the harm, but the fact that after thousands of years the cave was suddenly open to the atmosphere, and so bacteria and fungi started to destroy the pictures. You need a special permit to enter the cave now, and very few people can get that, unless they're scientists or have some official status. It's a shame, but I can see that they had to do something to protect the cave. So that means you can no longer see this rock art. Well, not exactly. What they've done is recreate the drawings in a man-made cave, which you can visit. Oh, brilliant! Yeah, the authorities decided to reproduce the two best sections of the site, so they've created a life-size copy of the Hall of the Bulls and of the painted gallery. It's just a cement shell, which corresponds in shape to the interior of the original. So now you can visit the caves without actually harming any of the fifteen thousand year old paintings.、Mm -hmm. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four, a second session on interview skills. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Hello there, everyone, and welcome to our second session on interview skills. Now we have already looked at what to say in the interview and what to wear, so let's consider non-verbal behaviour, or as it is more often called, body language. Believe it or not. Research has shown that this is what makes the strongest impression on people we meet. Frequent eye contact is one aspect of body language which goes down very well with interviewers and creates a good impression. Looking at people means that you're sure of yourself and confident. In fact, one famous car company even makes a note of the level of eye contact candidates make during their recruitment process for this very reason. So it is very important to maintain eye contact. But be careful how you do it. Avoid staring, as this is a sign of hostility. But avoiding eye contact altogether and looking away or down is even worse. But the general message is maintain that eye contact. Believe me, the eyes have it. Now, along with eye contact, smiling is one of the other important non-verbal actions which say more to the interviewer than any answers you give. A good way to create a good impression during the first few minutes of your interview is to smile warmly when you meet the person or people who will be interviewing you. It shows them that you are relaxed. Facial scanning takes a triangular route, from the eyes down to the mouth and back to the eyes. Even when you aren't speaking, an interviewer will be noticing your mouth, so give a relaxed smile whenever you feel it is appropriate. Now, not surprisingly, interviewers pay most attention to a person's face or head during an interview, and they certainly pick up a lot on what they see. Researchers have identified nodding as going down very well with interviewers. This simple gesture shows that you are listening and paying attention. Another useful head gesture is to tilt your head slightly to one side. Now, this reinforces that you are listening well to what the interviewer is saying to you. 
However, tilting your head back isn't such a good idea, as this signals arrogance. And drooping your head forward indicates that you are lacking in confidence. And as we all know, that is exactly the opposite of what an interviewer wants to see. So the message is, mind your head. Now posture, or the way that you carry yourself, is an important area of body language to be aware of. And it is one of the first body language signals that interviewers read as you enter a room. Posture also matters when you're sitting down. A well-supported position, with your shoulders square and sitting full back on the chair, will give the impression that you are confident, which is just what the interviewer wants to see. I once interviewed a candidate who perched right on the edge of her chair throughout. I kept feeling that she was about to run out of the room in terror. However, occasionally leaning forward slightly when the interviewer is speaking reinforces the message that you are keen and interested, as well as showing the interviewer that you're actually listening to what they are saying. But don't overdo it by leaning too far forward. That can be a bit distracting for the interviewer. Now, we all tend to use our hands to gesture, especially when we are explaining something or as we become involved in what we are saying. This is fine. It shows that we are keen and perhaps even excited about something. However, what can work against someone at an interview is when they fidget. This kind of moving about is, of course, what we do when we are nervous and fidgeting can be very distracting to watch. So if this is a problem for you when you get nervous, it is a good idea to practice sitting with your hands gently resting in your lap or on the arms of the chair. Try not to fold your arms, though, as this tends to look uncomfortable or hostile. But whatever movements you make, be careful with your hands. They need to be kept well away from your mouth, head or face. In fact, experts say that when a hand flies up to or over a person's mouth, it implies that the person is worried or wound up about something. For most of us, staying calm in an interview situation is a challenge, so putting in a bit of practice in advance will help. So, to end with, here are a couple of suggestions on how to improve our body language. A good idea is to choose a role model, such as an actor or fictional character, or a public figure or someone you know. Then sit calmly and imagine that you are this person. Now, other countries have different body language signals. So remember that if you are being interviewed abroad, you may want to check if there are any special gestures to avoid. It's also a good idea to get used to reading body language signals. You can do this by simply watching how people interact in public places, such as on the streets or in restaurants. And finally, when people have struck up a rapport, it is reflected through the natural mirroring of each other's body language movements. So you can use this to your advantage by occasionally mirroring the interviewer's own movements. For example, if they lean over to one side, you can do the same a few seconds later. It helps to create a special effect known as similar to me. But don't do it too often or the interviewer will notice. Now, any questions before we move on to interview listening skills? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. I know you told your friend you're not okay. And tell me what's wrong and why you never said you felt that way. I guess you're trying to.